Hello everyone, I am Matteo. Hi, I'm Tushita. And our talk is called Building Applications with the Neural Net Repository. Welcome everybody. Um, if you've been to our um, Neural Net Repository talk last year that was titled Fantastic Neural Networks and Where to Find Them, this is a little bit more application oriented, so it's called Fantastic Neural Networks and, how and where to use them, which doesn't make really any sense, but whatever. <laughs> So, um, okay, um, this is an outline of the talk. So we start with um, what's new in the repository. We'll showcase some, so we will, we, will, we will show some new models we have added, and then we will show some application which were um, built with these models at the, this year's uh, Wolfram Summer School. Um, and then we'll go for some live training uh, using some of the models of the repository. So Tushita will start uh, with showing the new models. So the initialization cells has uh, some code which we will deal with later. But again, this is a Harry Potter themed introduction to the neural net repository. So this is Nimbus 2000. And it's 30 years of Mathematica and 20 years of Harry Potter. So let's also celebrate that. <laughs> so anyway, and that's also from the theme of the talk. So anyway, we have the new model, which is an improvement to the existing ResNet models. And these makes uh, them, uh, the accuracy go higher and the training faster. So that's the improvement or the improved version of ResNet here. And uh, correctly, it's uh, identifying it as a broom. And you can do, so the best thing about uh, the neural network repository is you get these output as a computable, so what we call the knowledge base. So we, it, you get it like a in a computable form. And you can query about other properties. And here we have the query of the definition. So it just gives you what's a broom is. And it's linked to the entities uh, which we have. So other than Broom, you can also query about the top probabilities of what else it might uh, think uh, it to be. But Broom was a good guess here. So let's move on. So, the, so in feature extraction models, so we had all the glove models before. So now we have contextual word representation. So it's just not um, looking up table for tokens. It actually uh, produces the embedding that depends upon the context or the like where the word is used in a sentence. So we will try to show that with an example here. So the model there is Elmo, and it's a Fairly complicated architecture would take you a long. Okay, so the person who built Elmo is there. So Jerome is there, and he's pointing something. And uh, well, he he has a talk. Uh, so a main part of this talk was to introduce you to all the models so that you can go and attend individual talks. So that was uh, also uh, there. I ha I think I have written it here. So for more information on natural language processing, we have Jerome's talks. So yeah. Uh, and then it produces three distinct uh, 1,024, that's the uh, size of the embeddings uh, produced here. And uh, let's, uh, show the architecture, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, this is the architecture of Elmo. And again, these are pre-trained models. So the architecture is broad and the weights are broad. So you have it all ready for use. And here we take, um, so here is a, a, again, this piece of code is directly from the repository. So you can just use it to see embeddings. And obviously, uh, Elmo is amazing, and so is Jerome there. So <laughs> we, just, we just took the Elmo is amazing sentence, and we are just mapping the dimensions uh, of these embeddings. As we said, there were three vectors, two of them, uh, where, uh, con so I think two of them were context dependent, one is not. So uh, yeah, that's uh, what we are getting the dimensions of. But the best part about Embo Elmo that was missing in the glove models is that it refined the semantically nearest word. So that's, uh, that's actually what I wanted to show you here. 
So here, if you see, I am trying to find the semantically nearest word to play. And here it says, Harry received the Nimbus 2000 that was shown in the first uh, image so that he could play for the Gryffindor words. So here it refers to the act of playing a game. And then uh, the sec, so I am comparing it to two sentences where uh, we are saying that it's a two-stage play, so more like a theater. And then Quidditch is a sport that is played at Hogwarts. So essentially, if it was not uh, semantically, it was not uh, nearing for the con it was not looking for the context. It would have uh, guessed play as the word theater that would be closer. But if you actually evaluate uh, this uh, this piece of code, you would see that it finds played that refers to the game or that refers to the context that the word play has been used in the sentence. So that's an improvement, or that's what. Elmo brings in, um, and Matteo will show uh, training, uh, like how you would train, uh, reuse this model uh, for some other applications. So that is towards the end of the talk. So now let's go to more of the other applications. So the image processing, uh, we have added a network that increases the resolution of images. So it's a very simple linear architecture that's inspired by VGG. And it takes these low resolution images and does some kind of upsampling. So this is the net. So it's the VDSR as we uh, refer very deep net for super resolution. So we take an image. And uh, this is the scale or uh, zoom. Or we are going to zoom it down by this factor. So here we are going to do two ways of upscaling. One is using the VDSR, and the other is just using traditional uh, image processing tools. And um, so here we are just uh, using that by re image resize. So let's now compare these two results between the neural network one. So that's NN upscaled. And the naively upscale, which is not uh, that naive, but yeah, but uh, image processing upscaling. Uh, so here, let's just um, use to compare the results. So here you see the naive version of it. And hopefully, you will see the difference between the, the N and version. At least in the edges, you will see the definition has increased. Um, one thing for all of these uh, networks, since it's it's trained in a zoom factor of two to three, so it's best used in this uh, zoom scale. So that's, that's one thing we have seen from practice. So then again, there are these series of cycle GANs uh, that's there in repository that can take a photo, do a Van Gogh style thing to it, or Monet, or I am not good at pronunciation of names, so I'll just leave it to there. Uh, so there are a series of uh, cycle GANs, and then you can make oranges and apples and zebras and horses. So um, I'm not sure why you would do that, but but you can do that uh, using these models. But oh. No, it's 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 no no it's it's trained on so yes yes most of these models are trained on a very large collection of images comprising everything. Yeah 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 I mean it really depends on 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 what the image what the network was trained on. So it's like so for example that that model like horse to zebra that will turn photos of horses into photos of zebras if you give you the photos of a cat that has no idea what a cat is. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about the domain the network was trained on and, 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 and stay in the domain. As long as you do that, you're fine. And most of the network are trained, like, for example, image classification networks are trained on millions of images across uh, uh, lots of different classes and so on and so forth. And so some are very general purpose, some are, are quite narrower, but it really depends on what the initial task is. So, uh, yeah, that's.
uh, one point something million images. Like the full image net is 14 million, but the, yeah. So, yeah, so this one's just getting the style of Van Gogh and the previous image that was loaded. But, uh, okay, so again, there are a series of cycle GANs. Uh, I guess I am, uh, let's go to the, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, go back. Let's go back. Yeah. You see, there, there is uh, well, one of the bullets say it doesn't need matching pairs. So it's it's a novel technique. So this is uh, so as uh, one important premise. Maybe it wasn't clear, but most of the modeling is for this was not were were not created by us. These are um, re-implementations of of external models, to, uh, like mainly coming from academia. Uh, so this particular one is a re-implementation, and yeah, so it's it's based on this uh, uh, fancy technique, which is actually which is called cycle GAN. You can look it up. There's a paper. Um, it, it uses um, adversarial training, um, and and yeah, I mean the, the the nice thing is that it doesn't need matching pairs for that. So you 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 you, you can throw at it a bunch of real world images and a bunch of like Van Gogh paintings, and it will learn to map. That is also, I mean, that, that unlocks all these like weird. So, for example, maybe summer to winter you could do it with matching pairs because you can take the picture of the same place. But like horse to zebra, you cannot do it, right? You cannot play, take an exact picture of horse and that take away the horse and put a zebra in the same exact position for thousands of images. Yes, and a collection of zero pictures, and that's it. Yes. So, uh, so now I'll come to the new sections that's added in the repository. So there is semantic segmentation models that have been added quite recently. And then we have nine of those. So um, I will just take an example of one and show you. Uh, so this, uh, this model was trained on cityscapes data and it's uh, really important for self-driving cars. And um, so, this is, uh, so here we will take this model, give it an image of Diagon Alley because that was the closest image I could get for, uh, with the cityscapes data. So that's the image. And then there is this function result. Uh, I can say what, so the function generally, it does the pixel wise uh, segmentation, finds out what classes are there. Uh, so it will delete, um, so it will find out different classes and then place back uh, colors to the classes and to each pixels uh, of the class and then finally it will give you the o the image, uh, the, the, the mask, the overlay uh, the stuff legend. on the, uh, the mask on the image and then it will give you the labels of what classes it found. So all of this stuff is defined in the last slide, that magic result function is actually defined in the last slide, it's, there is a initialization code. So yeah, it does find certain things that's not actually there, like there is no bed for some reason. It found a bed, I have no idea. Uh, but that's, uh, but that's, uh, that was also not trained on, on Harry Potter pictures. <laughs> yeah. so, so there is a whole section and there are different models that's uh, trained on different uh, types of data. So the cityscape uh, data and then you have the the famous Pascal walk and the MS Coco data sets. Uh, so next I will move to another new section that's uh, language modeling. So these networks were actually trained here at Wolfram Research. So there are different models trained. Uh, so I'm showing the English character ones, but then there are uh, models for C and JavaScript that you can use for say code completion. So it will auto complete the code. Uh, so here we are trying to, uh, just exemplify one of uh, these models. So here we are taking the character level language model. It means that it just pr tries to predict the next character given the set of characters you are feeding it um, to the model. So and uh, so again, 
this generate sample is the magic uh, function that's there at the uh, at the end of the presentation, so in the initialization cells. So I am just giving. Oops. Okay, there is something wrong with the. In, let me just try to. Um, no, that, that that's the initialization initialization code. Uh, so let me go back. Oops. <laughs> yeah. You weren't then, supposed to see that yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go back to the, okay. So yeah, so here we are generating sample with this Harry P and it just finds, it just generates a random piece of uh, text, but, but it doesn't do such a bad job because whatever it generated, given that it's just generating one character, just uh, it's a character level model, it, whatever it, Generated makes sense, at least to me, says Harry Potter said in the police senator. And there is a factor here, that's the temperature sampling. So if you play with this factor, so let's just do one, uh, one more um, um, rerun of the same thing, it still makes sense. But if you increase this temperature sampling, it will essentially sample from a wider distribution and you will start getting more garbage or characters that are, so you'll start, um, so it'll generate samples from a wider distribution, you will start getting improbable characters um, while it generates the function index. Yeah, ju ju something just put crazy. it to 10, yeah. yeah. So that will generate something really crazy. So yeah, point 0.4 is a good uh, estimate or narrow enough distribution. Uh, to get a good uh, answer. So now let's use the same model for auto-completion. And so this is, again, a chunk of code for auto-completing uh, auto completing words. And here I have taken the names of my favorite characters in that order and um, uh, try to make it auto-complete the last names. Uh, well, Harry Potter seems to be very popular on the data set that's Wikipedia that it was trained on. Uh, the Severus Snape, Albus Dumbledore was not often used. But a good thing to notice is that whatever uh, second names we are getting, <coughs> they are valid second names. So they are not that it just learned a random word. It sort of gets that it's a name and a second name and it guesses quite good second names. So again, there is a talk uh, for NLP. There is a hands-on session uh, for NLP. And then there is uh, there are two other talks uh, where all the different functions that's there in neural networks for neural network frameworks for NLP. And um, separately, there is an NLP talk as well. So this is another section in the repository that's speech to text. So this was the, this is the deep speech model that's uh, uh, trained on English data. So again, this model consists of convolution layers, uh, each for time and frequency, and then it has um, different uh, gated recurrent units. Uh, and then finally, uh, it is using the beam search decoding, uh, and then this is, Essentially, this with some other uh, fanciness is uh, made in speech. Uh, it's the back end for speech recognized that will be there in 12. So this is the audio clip. Let me play the audio clip. I <laughs> preloaded the audio clip. I'm not, oh, uh, I think I have no. But I think audio could not be, no, it maybe, not. maybe we come out from the speaker. Oh. I'm not sure, who knows. Yeah, maybe you can put the microphone here. Yeah, I am here. trying to put the microphone here. <laughs> you are a wizard, Harry. So I just said, you are a wizard, Harry. So, and Matteo could not guess it because of my <laughs> accent. But let's see what the, what the network does. And we were trying it today morning and he could not get it. But the network does a better job than Matteo did. Yeah. So <laughs> that's human proof versus like human versus AI right here. So, so that's 
that's more or less all the section. There is another section for object detection, but we have uh, presentations for images uh, from, again, respective set. Uh, they'll talk more about each of these models and what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. But here, because it's harder to train, uh, uh, train custom applications without a GPU and a data set. So we initially planned we'll make it hands-on, but then the maximum we could do is make a cat dog classifier with images. So we thought we will just take use cases from students who had spent a year, uh, sorry, a week, I didn't mean to say a year, a week or one and a half weeks in summer school, and these are all projects which I'm highlighting from there, so they, it's just made in one or one and a half weeks time. And uh, so we will go over the different tools that we have to make custom applications while we discuss these projects. So the first one is image classification, so this one is used to uh, classify plugs and connectors, and uh, then we will, so this is the model uh, that he chose, uh, so this project was done by Rishabh from Boston University. So he chose this model because it had the maximum performance, uh, the highest performance, although that was, this is kind of the largest of the models. It's around 440 megabytes. Uh, so here, what he did was to uh, take the relevant layers. So he's taking all the layers until um, here, so the negative three. Uh, he's just dropping the linear layer on the softmax layer. That is what you need to drop when you are making your own applications because these were trained on ImageNet competition data, so there are 1,000 classes of images there. So when you are making your custom applications, you will not have the same classes. So so that's uh, what you what is done here. So it's taking all of it until those linear layer and softmax. So these are the classes of connectors and plugs, which, uh, so that's the list of it. There are 32 of them. So this is, this is essentially all network surgery functions that you would use to make your applications. So here what we are doing, uh, let's go one step at a time. So we are pre-pending the, this, cut sections of Adam model, so we are net taking till the last, we are just dropping the last um, three layers, so last two layers essentially, so you can also do net drop for that um, for that part, and then we are prepending it with the image augmentation layer, and then after that, we are adding the two layers that we removed, but now we are adding it in a way that, uh, so the softmax would take the length of the uh, connector list because we have put a decoder that has the classes given by this list. So essentially that's the network surgery that we have done. So if you can, if you go ahead and see, these are all uninitialized, that's why it's grayed out. So there is the image augmentation layer that we prepended. Then we have the entire thing from the my Adam net, and then and then essentially appended or like joined the last uh, two layers to give the net. So that holds for network surgery, and then the final section is how you would train it. We are not training it here again. Uh, we don't have the training set. Um, it's it, it was kind of huge. Uh, so. This is essentially uh, how you would train um, this surgery the model. I don't know. I don't know what the term <laughs> is, but yeah. So you would take the surgery model. So that's a surgery model, and then you have the training set. And this is what is called like you uh, do transfer learning using learning rate multiplier. So that's the function uh, in Wolfram language. So what we are doing here is we are changing only the weights, so we are just let, letting the last few layers learn. So anything beyond 6a is learning, and everything above 6a is kind of fixed. So we are, we are not letting uh, anything above 6a learn. Again, this is uh, an experimental thing you need to do and see which one gives you the best results. But he found out that everything 
uh, yeah. towards the end of 6A is um, working. So th the previous layers are fixed to the original values from the original models. Yep. And mostly you need to use that because we don't even have such large data sets for making everything yeah. learn. So this is the pre-trained model from the summer school, and mm. we will see that it works. Uh, it says that this is a USB. So one thing to mention is that this project took like one week, yeah. but they were done by students which were learning the language, learning the theory. If you know what you're doing, you, you, can, you can make this thing in one day, basically. So yeah, um, let's move to the next model. So here, uh, they uh, again, he has, uh, he was doing a rooftop recognition to find the solar energy potential. Uh, so again, it's the Adam, the same model that performs quite well. And um, the same principle as in like, we are dropping the last three layers. And here we need to resize uh, to the initial image size that we are feeding, so we are, feeding 500 cross 500 images. So that's uh, where we are uh, resizing. So changing the, in, like changing the net encoder. And then finally we are joining similar uh, to what we did last time. So this is the original, uh, oops, let me just, yeah. this is the original net. Uh, we dropped the last three layers. We need to put it back, uh, customized for our application. So this is how we put the thing. So we are just putting this stuff back again. Um, so this is done via net join. And then we are just taking the first part to cut off and uh, the rest of the things that we put back together. So let's go again. The same principle holds. We are not training it. It was trained on a well-known data set. Uh, so we are importing this trained network. And let's go ahead and see how good or bad it works. So this is, again, taking the geo um, functionality in our, net, in our framework, uh, taking an image, resizing it to a nice zoom level, because um, you need to match the zoom level to the initial training um, trained um, networks and see what the training set was or how your training set images look. So after doing uh, that, so this is, so all it needs is the latitude and longitude. So I fed in the latitude and longitude of Champagne. So this is, I don't know which part of Champagne is this, but yeah, this is some image of Champagne. Uh, I let the detector, so the, the trained net uh, run on this image, uh, get the mask, and then we can s do a similar thing, overlay the thing. So this is the action image, this is the mask, and then we just overlay one thing over the other. So it pretty much works great. So this is, so the network was trained on a data set that we got publicly, it was a publicly available data set, but mm, for testing we are just using images that we are downloading from Geo image. So, yeah, I think the presentation Yeah. <clears throat> so, I'm afraid this won't go as planned because we were, so uh, I was supposed to do some training now, um, and we were supposed to use my laptop, which has a GPU, but uh, like it was freaking out, we're connected to the uh, external projector for some reason. So this laptop doesn't have a GPU, and so I think we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I regularly use an external monitor with that laptop. I really have no idea why. OK, so yeah, um, so I will attempt to show a retraining of our language model on uh, Pokemon names to create a Pokemon name generator. Uh, this was inspired by some, okay, there, there, is, there is a blog which, which does all these crazy experiments. Uh, you, you can look it up. It's very funny. It does things like um, training uh, language models on, on cooking recipes and so on. And, and, um, it's called Lewis and Quark. It's a Tumblr. Uh, yeah, anyway. So, um, 
So we're going to retrain uh, our uh, Wolfram language model uh, from scratch. So um, <clears throat> this is one of the models for which the architecture you use for training is different from the architecture you use for evaluation. So here um, I, I'm getting the um, training architecture by specifying the setting argument here, which is training net. And what this thing does, if you're familiar with language models, this is an architecture for teacher forcing training. So this is the actual network we are going to train. The input is fed to both of these ports. We take the most, as, as in the, the, the most function of the Wolfram language, and the rest of the, of, the sent, of the input sentence, and compare the predictions from the network for each, from the following character of each character in the string with the actual uh, next character. So this is, uh, this is called teacher forcing. So we have the architecture. We can get the data from the entity system. And it's just a list of Pokemon names. Um, OK, now <laughs> we'll see. So this took one minute on my laptop, but it can take a crazy amount of time here. 29 minutes. <laughs> OK, these, these will not, I mean, there, even if you train for half of the time, it, it, it will still be too bad. So, um, um, it's, it's not really about how many, but it's more about which GPU. It's like you, you, you can, in, print, in general, you can parallelize across different GPUs. And the more you have, the best, but, it, it, you know, it's not like you use a you, you use a um, hundred GPUs and you get a hundred times speed up. Yeah. So and it also I mean it, it it's a very complex um, <coughs> um, business in general because it depends uh, a lot on how also how big your model is, how large your data set is. If you have a very uh, tiny model with a tiny data set, there is basically no point in training on a cluster of 20 super powerful GPUs because their performance will be basically the same as training on a one single laptop GPU. So it really depends on what your application is. For the, so th this is a re reasonably, I mean, you can also call it a very um, lightweight training. Uh, so it, it will only take one minute. I mean, we're, the training set is one, it's like 800 of these strings. So let's see, this is the length. Um, data. Oh, of, of course, <laughs> it's raining. Okay, let's just stop this. Um, so it's 900, so it is a very tiny data set. Um, uh, yeah, if there is enough time, we, we, could, we could do that. Pokemon names, yes. So, so the way a language model works is that a language model is a system in which you input a string, and um, and the language model predicts what the next token of the string would be. You can have both character level and word level, so you can predict the entire word. You can predict single character. This is a character level model, and you know if you if you feed back what you have already predicted to the input, you're just writing things, right? This is how a language model works. Um, so this is basically learning the structure of this data set, which is how usually a Pokemon name looks like or sounds like, whatever it is. Um, and so that is what he's attempting to do. Unfortunately, this will work very bad and will output random garbage. <laughs> but um, I mean, on, on, my, on my laptop, the results were, were actually pretty, uh, I mean, pretty good. It was like very, Pokemon. yeah, Pokemon-ish names. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. And uh, in, in so uh, technical detail for this, uh, you've seen I have um, I have appended uh, a full stop after each Pokemon name. At generation time, I, I use that full stop to stop generation. So it's like when it's trained, I input like uh, I pick a letter at random and I say to network. Keep generating until you hit a full stop. Uh, 
So, okay, so now we have our trained, or let's say badly trained um, feature processing architecture. So now we have to extract this guy from here um, and perform some surgery. So <coughs> what we need to do, let it, let's see. So we, with this statement, we extract this part, which is the actual language model we have to train. Um, and we have to make some modifications. Actually, this is predict comma one, so it's this part. Okay, this is a bit technical, but uh, so the main point is that when you train with teacher forcing, as you read the input string, you have to predict each next character as you read the string. While at evaluation time, you only have to predict the character next to the final one, because that's what you're interested in too. So these, um, I mean, this code here is to modify this architecture so as it only predicts the, the, the character next to the last one and not the characters next to, next to each character as it reads the string. So you can see the final, um, the final structure takes a string as input and in the output, it, uh, it outputs a probability vector of size 97 uh, which is basically the, 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 the number of, of characters in lowercase alphabet, uppercase alphabet, and some punctuation. That's what it is. It, it, it will still generate. That, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's the point. It, this is not uh, about trying to copy stuff from the data set. This is about learning the structure of the data set and, and, and keep going to extrapolate. Of course, if you feed the beginning of an actual Pokemon name from the data set, you have very high probability that the network will just complete it. Because, but, but I mean, that's not how you're supposed to use it, of course. You don't want to copy. Um, no, there is still an infinite number of examples, an infinite number of ways you can complete that. But as the network reads it, it basically thinks, okay, this looks a lot like what I've already learned. So I, I, I'm very confident that the right next character, the correct next character, is the actual next character from the, the name in the data set. Definitely, yes. Yeah, but that's because in most of the Pokemon names after a P there was vowel. Yes, it is. Um, well, so I'm actually not, uh, you know, language models are, are kind of uh, tricky. I, I, I'm not sure if they actually would qualify for Supervisor on supervised. Maybe maybe Jerome has some some hints about that. So basically, in a, in a language model, you you compare your input with a label, but you don't have to actually label data by hand, because the label is the actual next character from the string. So, so yeah, it's like so. The question is: Does language model training qualify as supervised training or unsupervised training? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so it's like. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it, there, there's a fine line between supervised and unsupervised training in this case. Good question. Um, yes. Yes, because um, you can assign, basically you can assign um, probab a probability to, 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 this, to the whole string. So if the probability is high, then it, it, it yeah, 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 yes, definitely. Um, this is how, these are how language models are used to improve speech-to-text applications. So when you have your speech-to-text model, you have a network which reads audio and spits out characters. But that network doesn't really know a lot about written language. So after that, you can refine that step by having a language model read that string. And if it finds some, for example, the, the, the speech-to-text might output a misspelled word, right? The language model is able to identify a misspelled word because they have low probability, and it can fix it. Yeah, 
What do you mean by cipher data? Ah, uh, well, that's very tough because that's that. Uh, it's not like you have a you, you have a single misspelled character that's like complete. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, the new function speech recognizing 12 will, will feature language model correction over the output of. The <laughs> okay, fine. Fair enough. So, in that case, maybe not. Who knows? But I don't know, maybe wizard. You no, know, the point is that you, 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 you can imagine that in, in some, in the training set for the language model, the word wizard was appearing much more frequently than the word wizard, whatever that means. And so maybe the language model could have decided, you know, I'm not sure about this, let, let's make it wizard. But yeah. Sure, 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 sure. That, Yeah, but the point is, uh, you have to think. So when when you go from character level to word level, you 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 get the problems of out, out of vocabulary. Like um, a misspelled word will likely not be recognized by a word level um, uh, model because there is no match for for that word in all the words the model knows, right? But, but give me a silly example. Give me a carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Say those two things yes. Fast True. Yeah. But it might be that the model is trained on people much more often saying give me a beer. Yep. Yes, definitely. So give me a beer. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Come out and give me a beer, not give me a pen. yes, in that case it would work. But if if you actually say give me a beer and, and the, the 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 speech to text model will transcribe a misspelled version of the word beer, then a word level model will not be able to correct it. While a character level model will. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's look at, at at the garbage that this thing will will output. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's even worse than I expected. Um, Tushita, is this eleven point three? Ah, this eleven point. Okay, this will. Okay. Yes, sure. Yes, yes. Okay, this was actually meant to be run in 12, but I mean, that, 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 that's not a big deal. The point is that this will not be the work, but the result will be. No, it's a very general thing. And so uh, in, in, here in this function, I was using a, a, a syntax which is only available in 12 to do temperature sampling inside the network without having to break it into pieces. Basically, temperature sampling is about uh, dividing your, so, so this, this, this models output a probability vector for the next character, right? So it, with, with temperature sampling, you, before uh, actually sampling for this vector, you divide the, the vector by a constant, which is the temperature. And, and if, you, if you think about it, this means that for uh, basically very, let's see, for very high temperatures, um, all the probabilities will, will kind of become the same, so the, 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 uh, the distribution will, will flatten out. And this is what Tushit have shown when inputting temperature equals to 10 in the language model sampling, and it was output random characters. If it, for a very low temperature, the, the distribution, I, I mean, the peaks become even sharper and the dips become even lower. And so uh, temperature sampling is a way to uh, actively modifying the, the distribution for which you sample every time. So here I was just using a, a handy syntax we introduced in 12 to do this, but this is not 12, and so it was not working. Let's see now. <laughs> okay, this is pretty amazing, actually. I didn't expect it to work this bad. Okay, it, it's not very Pokemon-ish, but I mean, this... <laughs> this thing is absolutely amazing. No, you know what happened? I, okay, 
I know what happened. I know what happened. It was starting from the pre-trained model of the language model. So it didn't really care about, so, it, it, so this model was trained a lot on Wikipedia data and for like one minute on Pokemon names. And so what you're getting at is basically Wikipedia out of this. Plus some weirdness. Okay, this, yeah, this is pretty funny. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so Tushita, can you um, run that? And, and maybe if you get time at the end of the presentation, we can, we, we can bring the model to this laptop and, 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 and show you the, the actual thing. Yeah. Yes, there is. Basically, the more data you have, the more stuff you can afford to train. Okay, so if your data set is very tiny, you only swap the last layer. Maybe you keep everything frozen and you only train that last layer on top of the other stuff, which is fixed. The more data you have, the, the, the more stuff you, you can afford to, to, to retrain. The, I mean, what the, the keyword is overfitting. If you have a very tiny amount of data and, and, you, and you expect to train the whole network on it, the network will just overfit. So it will memorize what your training set is and it will perform very bad at evaluation time on new examples. Uh, so, yeah, in general. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're looking for more quantitative statements. The, the, the point is that, yeah, because there is a huge number of possible variations you can have. I mean, it's not like three layers, two layers. It depends on which layer. Are we talking about convolution layers, or linear layer, or recurrent layers? What's the, dim the uh, dimensionality of the representation? Uh, what's the kind of network architecture as well? I mean, it's, you can possibly formulate a quantitative rule of thumbs for these things. And it's mostly about trying. I don't quite understand the question. So you were talking about like the hierarchical representational learning going on in. Ah, I see. Like they 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 put indications. The answer is they don't know what's happening. <laughs> What do you mean by distances? Sorry? What do you mean by distances? I don't understand. Well, if, 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 if a layer is going to go in linear, it's distance to the distance between those, one, one data set may be smaller for that between the other layers. Um, yeah, so the point is. <coughs> Usually, the, um, the, the shallow layers, meaning the layers which are closest to the inputs, they're usually very general purpose. As soon as you go deeper and deeper, they become more and more specialized for the task. So, that, 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 so that's why when, when you, when you um, so for example, in the, pl in the plug connector task, you, you take the network train on ImageNet, you will never retrain the first layers because ImageNet is a massive data set of basically everything. And those layers are super general. So they have, they have just learned to recognize basic shapes, basic patterns and colors. You, you never need to swap that. You can possibly do better on something trained on ImageNet right now for those layers. As, as you move down, they specialize more and more in actually discriminating ImageNet classes, which you don't care about. So th that's another reason why you, sh you should keep the first, basically. Uh, 
Um, well, video is a completely different thing. It's a completely different kind of, uh, of, of inputs. So, I mean, one very stupid way. Yeah, so, of course, I mean, you can always extract a, a single frame from the video that's an image and, 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 and then reproduce it. Uh, if not, I mean, another thing you can do, which is like, would be the zero order generalization by going from video to image, is to extract all the frames, classify all the frames, and, and combine the results in some way. But that's not really video processing, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the proper way to live with video would be either uh, three-dimensional convolutions, because a video is like a three-dimensional image, or a recurrent layer, a, a recurrent convolutional neural network. Because a video is, it can be seen as a sequence of frames. And, and so, sometimes you want RNNs to process sequences. Video? And not yet. Not yet. I mean, it, 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 it will it, it'll come at some point, but it's not in the, like, uh, it's, it's not a priority right now. Because it, it also, the, the, there is not even, like, proper uh, language support for videos right now. You know, you don't have all that suites of image manipulation functions for video. So it's about 10 people now. Well, for neural net, for neural net, it's like three or four. The, the entire machine learning thing is about 10. Yes. Three D convolutions are possible in event control. Yes. Ah, you, you trained and put it on. Okay, we'll see. We we'll 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 see. Okay, can you train also the the, the, the other one? Perfect. Okay, so how much time do we have? Oh, great. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I I had another like a live training with Elmo, but there is no time for that. And then yeah, you already seen this, so. <laughs>